Murder in the Rain, Portland's favorite Pacific Northwest true crime podcast, will be performing live on June 24th, 2023. Join us for a night of true crime stories at Portland, Oregon's beautiful Revolution Hall. Tickets are on sale now at revolutionhall.com and at murderintherain.com. Gifting is hard. This isn't news. But what might be news is that you can now send beer, wine, and spirits right to your friends and family with Drizzly, the go-to app for alcohol delivery. Which is good news because adult beverages are the only gift that no one ever returns. And Drizzly's tailored experience lets you find the perfect drink for the occasion, no matter what it is. You'll save time by shopping a huge selection of drinks from wherever you are. You'll save money by comparing prices on said drinks across stores. And you'll get to spend more time sipping with your gifties. You know, if they're the sharing type. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And get your favorite drinks delivered today. Ding dong, it's Drizzly. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. In last week's episode, we explored the background of Christopher and Lisa Northen. If you haven't listened, pause here and go back, because there will be spoilers today. On October 9, 2000, authorities found Chris dead inside his sleeping bag at the campsite he and Lisa had been staying at with their young son, Dane. Later that day, Lisa sought out medical help for some minor injuries, telling nurses and police that they were caused due to a fight she had with her husband, who had been abusing her. She told her story to multiple law enforcement officers, and over time, there were parts that were different or that people questioned. In this week's episode, we'll conclude the case of Lisa Northen and how her story, when compared to evidence, just didn't add up. We'll also dive into some major bombshells in her case. According to Lisa Northen, she had been regularly abused by her husband for years. She said the abuse got worse and worse, and soon he threatened their lives and even raped her on occasion. She told several people that Chris had claimed he would kill and dismember her and her children, something no one else had ever heard him say. She feared for her life. On October 8, 2000, she dropped her oldest son off with a friend and then met her husband at a camp a few hours away outside of Wallawa, Oregon. There, they intended to spend their weekend together. Lisa claimed that he had started drinking and possibly doing drugs during the day, claiming that he was an avid user of pot, cocaine, Vicodin, and Restoral, a sleeping pill. She said she confronted him about his alcohol and drug use and pleaded with him to get treatment. This sent him into a rage where he hit, choked, and tried to drown her. It only stopped when her son came out of the tent and asked him to stop. Things cooled down for a bit, but later that night, they fought again. He said he could kill them and no one would ever find their bodies. She believed him. After trying and failing to get by him to sneak away, she waited for the opportunity, which came once he had fallen asleep. She found her hidden car key and pulled her gun from the camera bag. She just wanted to scare him. Yet when she fired the gun her father gave her for protection, she hid him. She then grabbed her son, got into the car, and took off to another state. After receiving medical care, she told her story to multiple police officers and medical staff. Each time, details had slight changes. There were plenty of parts of her story that police questioned, particularly around those slight differences. For instance, that second bullet she fired that the deputy discovered, Lisa had told her story several times, and she ended up telling three different variations of how that additional bullet was spent. 
First, she told the deputy that she accidentally fired a shot when she was loading it back into her car after she shot Chris. Then, in another telling, she said it went off by accident right after shooting Chris as she ran away. Then, finally, the version she told her own father is that she went into the woods to try the gun out ahead of time, before she ever shot Chris. When it came to the evidence, authorities had even more questions for Lisa, and these questions would be integral to her case. The trial was set for July of 2001, and everyone was gearing up for a huge event in the small town of Wallawa, a town that never saw crimes of this caliber. When it came to Chris's autopsy, there were several key things to take note of. Chris Northen had been shot in the head. The trajectory of the bullet was a huge topic of conversation for everyone. Chris had been shot through his right temple, and the bullet exited through the left side of his head behind his ear at about a 70-degree angle. Mm -hmm. It then embedded itself into the sand, pinning some of the down stuffing from the sleeping bag and Chris's hair beneath it. This trajectory is impossible to recreate from what Lisa described, running away and firing aimlessly, which would have resulted in a near horizontal angle. The trajectory was lower. It seemed like you would have had to have been much closer to him and higher up, perhaps standing over him or standing on an incline. There was never an official location that authorities believed the shooter stood from, but there were a few scenarios that made sense, and none of them matched up with her story. Chris appeared to have been suffering from stomach issues, chronic inflammation or gastritis of the stomach, as well as thyroiditis. These things could have stemmed from pollution or even stress. Some of it could have even been genetic, as both of his parents had thyroid issues. But the chronic gastritis was debatable. Was it physical evidence of the stress he had endured in his marriage, which caused acid erosion in his stomach over time? Or did he ingest poison? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Definitely poison. His stomach was also empty. There was no food. Lisa mentioned in every iteration of her story that she had come back to the campsite and cooked them all dinner, and they ate it, and then he lost his temper. But there was no evidence that he had eaten dinner. His blood was taken to do toxicology reports, and those were very interesting. Lisa claimed that Chris was basically drinking vodka like water. Well, they found a bit of alcohol in his bladder, about 0.04%, but there wasn't any in his blood. Now, the way our body processes alcohol is that you may find alcohol in your urine longer than you would have it in your blood. So if it's found in your bladder and not your blood, that isn't necessarily going to line up with any degree of intoxication because it happened a Mm. long time ago. I was going to say it's more the timing, right? Because your body's processed it. Right. Okay. So that would allude to the fact that he was not inebriated with alcohol, right? The crime scene or the campground did turn up several bottles of alcohol. Some were half empty, some were near empty. These included bottles of wine, Kahlua, and bourbon, but there was no vodka. And Lisa was adamant that he was drinking vodka in that red cup. So what were these bottles there for? And where were the vodka bottles? And was she just, I don't know, digging up empty bottles to put her on the camp? I don't know. Chris Northen's autopsy showed levels of temazepam, also known as restoral, a sedative in his system. Now, Lisa said Chris was a light sleeper and often took sedatives to go to sleep. So you might be wondering, what is a large level mean? An expert took the stand and he said it was 2,900 nanograms per milliliter. To break that down to layman's terms, they asked, is that a little bit, some, a lot, a hell of a lot? And he said, that's definitely a hell of a lot. Typically, the capsules come in two sizes, 7.5 milligrams or 30 milligrams. In this particular case, that would equate to him taking three to five 30 milligram capsules that evening. This would have put him in a very deep sleep, 
which means it's very unlikely that he would have any kind of cognitive response or even be able to walk. Interestingly enough, police got Chris's medical records and were able to see all of his visits to his therapist and all of his prescriptions, which included allergy medicine, topical cream and antibiotics. But there was one thing missing. Chris didn't have a prescription for sleeping pills. So where did he get them? Did he buy them illegally, even though he had a doctor and a therapist that he saw regularly who would have prescribed them? Did he even choose to ingest them? Right. Did someone else give them to him? Did he know that he was given them? A lot of questions there. In court, they explored what the combination of a heavy sedative and alcohol in the urine in his bladder would mean. An expert explained that a person could have an overdose of a sedative, which would likely make them comatose. And when that person is comatose, they're unable to empty their bladder and wouldn't necessarily even recognize that they have a full bladder because, you know, they're comatose. If a person was so passed out off of sedatives that they couldn't even pee, would they notice if someone walked by them? Would they be coherent? No, they wouldn't. There were several mysterious marks left on Chris's chest. They looked almost like fingernail scratches right above his nipple, and they were each several inches long. While they looked like scratches, they were more closely consistent with burns. There was no evidence on his hands that he had been in a physical fight, which is odd if Lisa's story is accurate. Chris was completely nude inside his sleeping bag, and his entire body was covered in sand. This was something that was discussed heavily in court. Why would a person be covered in sand? Defense claimed Lisa explained it because he was sleeping nude on the beach at one point and she had to help him back into his sleeping bag. But prosecution had other thoughts. A lab worker for the forensic lab in Pendleton, Oregon, Jeff Dovchi, was on the witness stand describing that Chris's clothes were found near the water and his sweatpants had pocketfuls of river sand. Now, the sand in the pockets equated to roughly about a handful, which is a lot, right? So the DA asked, well, how would you get that much sand in your pockets if you weren't actually like putting it in your pockets? He said, could you get that by swimming? And he said, no. Could you get that from stirring up sand at the bottom of the river? Yes. So what he was alluding to is the fact that there had been a struggle, but it was likely not Lisa who was doing the struggling. Perhaps it was Chris. Mm. Lisa maintained in every version of her story that night that she had fired a shot out of sheer fear. It was not premeditated. She was simply defending herself and her child. So what would be the argument if that wasn't her motive? What is the motive? Many people think it's money. Lisa cared about few things in life, herself, her boys, and getting enough money to do whatever she wanted. That might mean having a husband or three. Chris's family believed she wanted his life insurance and full control over all of the properties they owned. Not to mention the benefits you get when you're a widow of a pilot. Oh, is that a thing? Free flights for life, baby. No. So this is something she has actually mentioned before. During one of her rants about the things she disliked about her husband, her friend asked, well, why do you stay married then? And she laughed and said, flying free. Is that really is that like still in place? That seems dangerous to to pilots lives. (laughs) It certainly does, doesn't it? Wow. Lisa told authorities that she had been beaten by Chris two to three times per week. That was questioned by many people. Though on occasion she was seen with bruises, there was only one domestic abuse call that resulted in an arrest with police. She claimed that he nearly always hit her in the face first. He would smash her head. He would drag her by her hair or kick her in the ribs. How was she not constantly sporting bruises all of the time when she was out on the beach in a bikini all day? Why was she not calling for help more when her friends who had connections with domestic abuse organizations could help her? How did she not need medical attention more often if the beatings were so frequent and so brutal? And and unlike so many cases where it's like, oh, if only she could have gotten help or we know how hard it is for someone to leave an abusive relationship. It's like she's still talking about 
like she's bitching about things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like this was this deep, dark secret. She is running her mouth about everything Which else is abnormal. And and she did for the year prior to this situation. She was regularly talking about the abuse, which is abnormal to most domestic violence victims. Right. They might tell one person or a few people maybe, but it's unheard of to tell every single friend and family yeah. member you have and not do anything about it. And and to then also not have the markings when you're turning around and saying, oh, he beats right. my face. And, does, and it's like so. And, you know, I'm not as educated on domestic violence as some, but I mean, from what I have learned over the years of us doing this is this does stand out as abnormal to yeah, me. Yeah, definitely. So why didn't she just leave? She had a great career in photography, a job that could take her anywhere. She had royalties from a book she had written with her ex-husband who, who he said she could have in their divorce. She had family and friends all over the place. She even hardly spent any time with him the last year of their marriage. They were constantly in different places. Well, she believed that divorce wasn't an option because it put her at risk. Her kids would have to see him during visitation. And if she fled with the kids, she might risk kidnapping charges. And those are very valid concerns. Totally, yeah. But there is something very odd that came up as the people in Chris's life were interviewed. And that is abusers typically don't just pick one person to abuse in their entire life, it would show up as a pattern. Yeah. There had to be someone in Chris's life who also saw his alcohol and drug abuse and his rage issues who would have been a victim to a physical outburst at some point, right? But there wasn't anyone. All of his friends said, yeah, he drinks, but not to excess. They said he never did drugs. Every woman Chris ever dated had a friendship with him. Their relationships didn't end poorly. No one ever mentioned his temper or him ever getting physical with them, which seems weird. Another question that came up regularly was why Lisa was so very wet that morning. Her friend testified that when they embraced, Lisa was wet enough that it made her own clothes wet. Yet she had been in the car for over three hours, probably with the heat up on high, which would likely mean her clothes would dry out a bit. So why was she sopping? Why did her brother say damp and her friend say sopping? Did she maybe like quick reapply on the way there? Yeah, what? Someone from Human Resources for the airline that Chris worked for, Hawaiian Air, was also interviewed. She said that she was the person who dealt with any issues employees might have. When asked if she had a record about an incident Lisa once shared around her husband slapping a flight attendant, she said that didn't happen. She would have known and there would have been a record. Chris didn't have any incidents in his record. The director of occupational safety and health for the airline was also interviewed. He was the person who handled all of the drug testing for employees. Lisa claimed that in one of her interviews, she had once audio taped Chris and another pilot bragging about their drug use and how they would hide it from their work. When asked about drug use, he said it would be impossible for a pilot to be a drug user and go undetected that long. At the time he was interviewed, he said they had tested all new employees and then they randomly tested employees on an ongoing basis. They would randomly select 25% of all employees for drug testing and another 10% for alcohol testing. Now, they would not be notified until they were in the air on the plane. So that way they had like 30 to 45 minutes before landing when they would take their test. If they were positive, they, the only way to keep your job would be to go straight to rehab. And if you d failed again, it's a mandatory termination. So he said it was just utterly impossible for Chris to have been a drug user or an alcohol user to the extent that she was explaining. Yeah, that would take some pretty deep corruption as far as, you know, if, if you believed what she said, it'd be like he'd have to be in cahoots with people way up high uh -huh. and who makes the scheduling decision and make sure, hey, make sure you don't schedule me for that random Well, and that's 25. also the thing. They said he didn't call in sick. Him and his, like, buddy Dave that they always piloted together, they never called in sick. So that right there was yeah, dismissed. Yeah. Not to mention, she was she said she was recording them. Police went and listened to every every audio she provided and they said there was nothing on there. Wow. 
It seemed like the trial was going to be a hefty one, with both sides coming up with strong arguments. But suddenly, when it seemed like the trial had just begun and the courtroom cameras were all set up to make excellent TV programs, it just ended. Lisa Northen, a woman so adamant that she had killed her husband out of self-defense because he intended to kill her, accepted a plea, an Alford plea. Oh, we've mentioned those before. It's essentially a plea of guilt, acknowledging there's enough evidence that you are guilty, but maintaining that you're not really guilty. Lisa Northen agreed to admit guilt for first degree manslaughter in exchange for 12 and a half years in prison. Everyone was shocked by this. Her supporters were confused as to why someone who should be let free would willingly accept such a long sentence. What was that evidence? Yeah. Chris's supporters thinking that's not enough. This is likely a cold blooded killer who plotted this and she gets to get out of prison after 12 years and continue her life. After her sentencing, Lisa continued to fight for her freedom from behind bars at the Coffee Creek Correctional Facility. Sadly, doing so was adding insult to injury to Chris's family. She appealed her sentence, claiming the recorded audio evidence that Chris and the other pilot admitted to doing drugs was erased by police. They were in on it. That was thrown out. She also went on to claim that Chris's parents were siphoning money from Dane's accounts, the money he received after Chris's death. That was dismissed. It was proved that that was not the case. She attempted to file a report against her son's guardians, some of Chris's friends, claiming they were involved in drug trafficking. And it was her preference that her ex-husband, Don, take on full custody of her second son until she was released. There was eventually a custody hearing on May 28, 2002 in Bend, Oregon. Lisa chose to represent herself, and it was a total shit show. (sighs) Now, she's legally allowed to do that. In that case, they just said you have to be able to pay for your own transportation from prison to the court with like a guard and everything. And she had that money. So during this hearing, Lisa made claims that Chris's father molested him when he was a child and that his mother had been a prostitute. She went as far as to demand that his father should have penile excitation tests before having visitation with her child. May I guess what that is? Sure. Is it showing them uh, material maybe and then seeing if they get an arousal now, response. I, I can't say for sure that they're shown that, but it is a test in order to judge if a man gets aroused by children or adolescents. And I have to imagine that you are oh, so they're correct. Pro- they're probably like tame, tame images, very but, tame image, like probably uh, swimsuit. Yeah. I'm guessing. Yeesh. Now, this has been used in cases where they're trying to judge if a sex offender is going to reoffend, but there is never any record that this occurred, right? So that's just hurtful. Like this lady. Now, then she went on to claim, well, Chris's friends, they're still drug dealers. They traffic drugs. Like that's what he does as a pilot. But in the end, it was determined that her son, Dane, would stay with his caretakers, which were Chris's um, best pilot friend and his wife. And they lived in the same area as Don, her older son's father, and he had visitation. So not only were they like his guardians, he regularly saw his brother and Don. And they would go on to say they could uh, come to the States a few times a year so they could see their grandparents in Oregon. And during that time, Lisa did have the right to have minimal visits with them as well. While what really happened during Lisa's trial was kept under wraps for a while, eventually it did come to light. In 2003, Queen Anne Rule, one of my favorite sleuthers, dropped her last book, and it was all about Lisa Northen and the death of her husband, Chris. This was the first time many people got to learn all about her full story, what went on in their marriage and the details of her court case. Rule interviewed dozens of people, reviewed all of the court documents, and she doesn't always do this but she laid out what she thinks actually happened. The biggest bombshell I think people clutched their pearls about is why exactly Lisa took that plea. Remember those computers that were stolen from the Northens' bend home? 
Oh, yes. Initially, everyone agreed that thieves pried the door open, stole her items. But later, Lisa suggested in one of her many interviews that Chris probably did it. He stole the computers himself because he was known to have issues with pornography. And some of it, she suggested, included children. But it would turn out that neither of those scenarios were true. Lisa had done some research and learned that when you delete something from your computer, it's never really deleted. So to protect herself, she sent some of her stuff to live in the home of one of her friends who eventually moved to the East Coast. That stuff included her, quote, stolen gateway computer. From jail, she smuggled a letter to her friend and asked her to destroy it because it would, quote, hang her because emails are forever and on that hard drive. The note spurred her friend to do the right thing and tell someone. She chose to call Lisa's lawyer. Now, some lawyers may have helped to suppress this type of evidence, but he instructed her not to destroy the computer or to give it to anyone because it may contain evidence. The trial was merely days away, so while he considered how to best unveil this information to the prosecution and the judge, an anonymous tip was called into the Wallawa County DA. Someone said over the phone that Lisa's friend had her computer that she had claimed was stolen. Soon, police on the East Coast arrived at her friend's house and successfully matched the serial number of the Gateway desktop to the serial number in the original police report. The FBI assigned Special Agent Ariel Miller from the Portland office to spend some time with her computer. As I mentioned, the trial was just a few days away, so it was unlikely everything would be done by then. But the focus was on emails, writings, and screenplays that may exist on the hard drive. And before long, Ariel did his wizardry and recovered damning information. First, it was her screenplays. They were like a recipe for your favorite dish if your dish was killing your husband. <laughs> All of her screenplays centered around a battered and abused woman who killed her husband in order to protect her own life. In each of them, the husband died in a similar fashion, something going through his temple, whether it a bullet or in one case, a spear. There were also the emails, emails from Lisa to her family. One email sent to her father that was recovered said the following, quote, It's been worse lately. I'm going to have to end it one way or another. There have been some really ugly public scenes and my friends at the pool look at my bruises and don't know what to say. Drowning is the best in terms of detection, but I want a gun for backup. And then we'll have to get a surefire disposal method. Both of us will have to throw the computers away because I just read that they can trace email on hard drives, but I will replace yours with a new one. Did the victim know about these screenplays? He knew she was writing screenplays. But he, never, he probably she hadn't like, hey, read it. No. The, check this out. So yeah. <laughs> she never shared them with him. There was only one person who ever saw him, and he did testify, so I'm glad you brought this up. She had gone uh, to another island, or I think it was on Maui, to a writing conference. And at that conference, she met a famous screenplay writer. And he liked her writing and took her under his wing and said, hey, you write a screenplay. I'll help you edit it and I'll help you sell it and we'll make a movie. And they worked together for months. And so he could tell everyone all the content from that screenplay, which was a battered woman going after a man and killing him. And they actually did have a potential buyer. But right when they were going to um, make that sale, another very similar screenplay was sold. And so theirs was dead in the water. Um, so he was able to take the stand and talk about that. So that is why they were specifically looking for screenplays on the computer. Wow. Do you know uh, Do you know the, the writer, the name? I do not. He had a pseudonym in uh. the book about this case. I'm sure if I could, if I got my hands on the court records, which I didn't have enough time to do, I, we could probably get his name. But hey, there's a little fun mystery for you. Wow. In another email to her father, she mentioned wanting to get a silencer and assuring him that she had not changed her mind. And finally, there were the searches. Casey Anthony, everyone. She searched a number of things from how guns work to how poison works and just how do you do forensics. As if the computer wasn't enough, readers also learned about Lisa's friend who, after testifying in court, dipped out of town as fast as she could, even though they specifically told her to stay in town. As she was leaving, another anonymous tip came in. 
In this tip, the caller claimed that she knew more than she said on the stand. Not only had Lisa once asked her if she had poison on hand, but she had also held on to Lisa's backpack since the morning after Chris's death. You know, the one she dropped in the corner mm-hmm. when she stopped by to pick up her son. I totally forgot about that backpack. I've been well, think- I I've told been- you it'd be oh. coming. <laughs> Police made their way back to her home to inquire about this tip. She eventually divulged that Lisa had, in fact, asked her if she had rat poison on hand because she had a big she had a big uh, farm. Right. Like, oh, yeah. Lisa's that makes like, sense. what do you got in there? You got any rat poison? Huh? Friend? But her friend wasn't that concerned on to why she was asking. But there was also another conversation over the phone where Lisa said she wished Chris would, quote, just go up that mountain and never come back and that she would, quote, drown him. But she'd probably be the one that got drowned. And yes, she had found that backpack later. And when she looked inside, she found two pairs of handcuffs and two odd devices that when she described them, police knew were tasers or taser guns. She gave the backpack to Lisa's brother, Tor. So not only did she have it, she gave it to someone who would want to protect the sister. Right, right. So after telling them the truth, she did agree to come back into court and testify about that. Of course, Anne's book was jam-packed with information. She did not shy away from questioning whether Lisa was a sociopath. She called out all of the lies she had made in the past, including rape allegations that were never proved, cervical cancer, thefts she had claimed taken place, and also how she had always indicated that Chris had been the one who planned the camping trip. But Chris already had plans that weekend. He intended to work on the house with his handyman, Don Strand. Chris learned from Don that Lisa planned a camping trip and he would have to cancel his plans to paint and go with her and leave Don to do the work. The vast majority of the book did not make her look good. But the part that probably irked Lisa's camp the most was when Anne theorized what she thinks might have happened. Let's read a bit from Anne Rule's book, Heart Full of Lies. I believe that Lisa spent two years creating a monstrous persona for Chris, one cunningly designed to make her actions appear justifiable when she lured him into a lonely place, far from help, and shot him in the head. An exhaustive review of the preparations Lisa made for this deadly weekend casts an appalling picture across the screen of one's mind. Chris wasn't expecting to go camping on October 6th, He was just home from weeks of flying and planned to paint his storage shed when Lisa told him she wanted to spend the weekend in the Wallawa Mountains. It's plausible that Chris went along with Lisa's plan because, as Dave Story said, Chris was always looking for solutions. Chris may have seen the camping trip as a way to save their marriage. They could have gone camping near Bend, but Lisa chose a county with a small population where murder investigations were rare. No one alive except Lisa knows what really happened from the time she joined Chris on that Saturday afternoon, October 7th, until the early hours of Monday morning. Apparently, the three of them spent Saturday night and Sunday morning together at the campsite without incident. Lisa herself had told Deputy Kevin Larkin that she left her son alone with Chris while she hiked. That wars with her description of Chris a few hours later. The thought of Chris holding a knife to the throat of the child he cherished is suspect and highly unlikely. Lisa maintained that had happened, and she drove away from the campsite Sunday afternoon. And even though she was afraid for her life, she went back. Why? To fix supper for a man who terrified her? I think she went back to trick Chris into swallowing an overdose of restaurant. The autopsy findings showed no food remained in Chris's stomach, so he probably didn't eat supper. Lisa recalled, however, that he had eaten Sunday evening, and that she and Chris were sitting in chairs besides the river when she chided him about his drinking. If Chris was truly a wife beater, why would she have waved a red flag in his face in such an isolated spot? It seems more likely that something like the following occurred. 
Believing that Chris was almost comatose, Lisa somehow maneuvered him so that most of his body was in the Lostine River, while she knelt in the sand over him holding his head underwater. She had emailed her father months earlier saying that drowning is the best in terms of detection, but she wanted a gun for backup. Now for good measure, Lisa zapped Chris's chest with one of the stun guns. He was burned, but not electrocuted as she had planned. The water was frigid, rousing Chris enough to struggle instinctively with Lisa to get to the surface where he could breathe. This might have been when she suffered a black eye. It's also quite possible that Lisa struck her own cheekbone with a rock to bolster her story that she had been fighting for her life. Chris would have had just enough strength to crawl out of the water as he lay on the sandy beach. Lisa must have taken off his soaked clothing and removed his sodden shoes, hanging his clothes on the remaining camp chair. If he were found naked, it would support her frequent claims that he raped her. There probably were moments where Chris rose up from the sand, confused and arms flailing, but the sedative in his blood wouldn't have allowed him to think clearly. As he rolled on the beach, his wet body was dusted completely with sand. At this point, Lisa must have resorted to an alternative plan. Somehow, she coaxed Chris into his sleeping bag. She certainly could not have lifted a 200-pound man herself and dragged him into it. She may have even whispered comforting words to him. He would have been too disoriented at this point to weigh her words or what was even happening to him. And then she must have zipped it up to his chin. Chris couldn't get out of the bag. Now Lisa waited. How long she waited, only Lisa knows. Although Chris's brain function was so heavily compromised, his kidneys were still working and his bladder filled to the point where he would have been very uncomfortable if he were in a state of awareness. But he couldn't urinate in his comatose state. Lisa went up to her vehicle and loaded the gun, accidentally firing one chamber in the process. The loud crack of a shot in the night air did not wake Chris up because he couldn't wake up. Once her gun was loaded, Lisa returned to the spot above where Chris lay immobilized in a sleeping bag and took careful aim, either from the knoll above Chris or from the side or from a position at his feet. There were no powder burns or gun barrel debris around Chris's head wound, so she was more than four inches away, but she was close enough so that not even a novice could miss as she used the gun her father had given her to protect herself. About a year after Anne dropped her book, Lisa Northen filed a complaint against her. She claimed that Anne's book damaged her reputation and that she was in fact the victim of domestic violence at the hands of Chris Northen. She only killed him to protect herself and her children. That case was eventually dismissed, and Anne Rule was awarded over $20,000 worth of attorney fees. <laughs> but she died, so I don't know what her team ever did with that. Oh. A few years later, someone else fired back at Rule. Richard Swart, an editor of a small-town Oregon paper, published a scathing article regarding Anne Rule's book in July of 2011. Days later, Anne Rule posted to her fans the following, quote, There's a backstory concerning the article's author that I cannot reveal at the moment. It will knock your socks off when my lawyer allows me to tell you about it. So what could she have possibly told us about Rick Swart? Was it that he knew Lisa? Kind of, but, but no. Rick was headed to Hawaii for vacation when he picked up a copy of Rule's latest true crime book, you know, for a bit of light vacation reading since he was going to Hawaii. As he turned the pages, he realized he knew Lisa Northen. He knew her as Lisa DeWitt, a girl he met when he was younger. He was interested in her and even asked her out on a date, but she never showed up. He couldn't believe that the girl that he once knew was the same person that Rule outlined in her book. So he wrote Lisa a letter. At first, she didn't want to talk to him because clearly media was not great to her. But eventually, she engaged with him. She explained that Rule had lied and exaggerated throughout her book. And in fact, she counted 287 errors and falsehoods within the text. So Rick decided he was going to do his own research and determine the truth. He published his article and called it 
Anne Rule's sloppy storytelling. <laughs> and it was published in the Seattle Weekly on July 19th, 2011. That is ballsy. You're going to go after Anne Rule. I mean, the queen. The ultimate. I research everything. Here's yep. every detail of everything ever. He basically, <laughs> he believed that Anne Rule exploited the story of a battered woman to make her look like a sociopath. The article disputed some of the claims about Lisa and what happened by just sharing Lisa's point of view. He did go on to share that her attorney let her down immensely. It was overheard by someone that when her attorney urged her to take the plea, he suggested that if she didn't take it, he would walk. And he knew she had zero funds left for a new lawyer. Now, honestly, that probably is true, because personally, I think when that computer came up, her attorney realized she was guilty. Yeah, that's not a matter of competence. And if I'm honest, could he be the anonymous caller? Oh, definitely. Just so that he didn't have mm -hmm. to deal with it. But Possibly. I'd say the same thing where it's like, I'm done. No, I'm not a clown who's going to go to court and try to like fight against. But this like stuff. without the computer, they may have had a solid chance with yeah. the computer. I can't imagine any jury would have let her off like yeah. she was going to get something. Yeah. So he was just doing her a favor by not dragging it out into himself a favor. Yeah. But I, I do believe he lost faith in her. Sort even interviewed Rule for the article, mentioning that she started off kindly, but less so when he asked her why the book was so heavily one sided with her interviews focused on Chris's family. And I will give him that she did do far more interviews with Chris's family, but she interviewed a lot of people. It wasn't just his people. But also he's the victim. If the right if the script was flipped and she had died, you would want to talk to her family. Right. His article went on to say how damaging it was for Lisa to read the book and to see it promoted on TV and that she was most hurt by the fact that her abuse was diminished to something made up in her mind. That's basically what Anne was saying was mm. she concocted everything. Now, all in all, his words were strong, but they were not as strong as Anne's. And no, Anne Rule wasn't going to knock anyone's socks off by telling readers that the author of this article Anne said was deliberately mean and full of inaccuracies knew the murderer. But she did knock their socks off when she posted a photo of author Rick Swart arms around Lisa Northen, and it was captioned by Lisa with, quote, this is my fiance, Rick Swart. <laughs> he was not only in love with the subject of Anne's book, oh he was engaged to her at the time the article was released in the Seattle Weekly, and he did not disclose that to, to the editors. They had no <gasps> idea. Oh, my God. <laughs> so when they confronted him about his article, he defended his choice not to disclose that information, claiming you purchased this as a freelance piece and I was selling you a product. And I will say they've looked into all of his previous work and it is very truthful. He does solid research and he's never been known to lie. So they, but this girl rejected him and he had to mm, prove well, they, they put the. Uh, yeah, I know. Right. He had oh, like prove he, was he had worthy. to earn her back. But they did um, reap the article still online and we'll have a link in our notes. But the editor has since added like a very lengthy mm. forward. So because she is the pettiest and that's why I love her. Anne Rule ended up filing a defamation suit against Rick for writing the scathing review of her book without disclosing the, the relationship. She ended up losing. And I think it is because they put the forward in. Mm. She ended up losing and was ordered to pay. Rick and the Seattle Weekly $10,000 each. And that kind of equals what she got from yeah, Lisa. From the so other one. it all worked out there. Now, for me, one of the most telling pieces is that one of the people that came to the defense of rules work was Lisa's own lawyer, Pat Birmingham, the same one I just told you about that said, hey, take that yeah. plea. So he he actually wrote in to the paper and was quoted as saying, I have not found a single assertion in Anne Rule's book, Heart Full of Lies, to be anything other than true and accurate. He then went on to say that uh, at least five of the explicit screenplays that she wrote on her computer were about a wife killing a husband who was 
her husband. The lead character was always modeled after Chris. So for her lawyer to Mm -hmm. say her book is accurate means everything I've outlined in this episode is accurate. And I did try to find marriage licenses. I did try to find a record of Ray. Like she did her research and she had more means than us. Yeah. Since Lisa's trial, Oregon legislature has been passed called Lisa Northen Bill. This basically forbids convicted killers from gaining any financial benefits from their victims' estates, and she's not allowed to write about him. Good. Uh, This was put into place basically to protect her son, Dane, as he took on all of his father's estate when he was a teenager. Lisa Swart ended up serving 12 years for the murder of her husband. She was released from prison in October of 2012. Once she was out of prison, she began advocacy work. She worked as a domestic violence advocacy and education coordinator for Voices Set Free, the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Her goal was to spread awareness about domestic violence by sharing her own story. Today, Lisa is out of prison and living her life and teaching yoga in Eagle Creek, Oregon. She continues to sell her and Don's book online. And as of this year, she did go back to court, this time for charges for reckless driving and driving under the influence. And I'm not sure where that's out now, but don't do that when you get out of prison. That's yeah. silly. Is she still with the Don that, guy? That's what I was going to ask. Is she with? She's with Rick, the, the, the writer. Yeah, yes, the, yes. Okay. they are Sorry. still married. Wow. Her youngest son, Dane, is 25 and lives in Oregon. Aokai is 31 and lives in Hawaii. They both travel the world together and seem to have a very fun and full life. They do have a relationship with their mother, or at least they did, as you can find photos online taken with her and her now husband, Rick Swart, and the two kids. Um, Her ex-husband, Don, ended up buying back the house where they raised Aokai, and I think he still owns it. Um, and he ended up raising Alki there, and that's where you know he had partial custody of the youngest son. I highly recommend this book because this was a long episode, but there are still so many details I didn't even get to uh, about the like the details in her divorces and the right. back and forth. And her husband actually paid that house off twice. And she thought he was her biggest advocate in the like custody trial. He finally was like, over it and she was devastated because she thought yeah i'll do whatever you want lady you know but yeah yeah he got remarried he had another kid yeah read it it's juicy it's a juicy one these kind of people sociopathic narcissists pathological liars are like the scariest people they are i would much rather encounter a very creepy man who looks creepy and acts I know creepy, to avoid him. And I'll be like, mm. she reels you in. She's fun. She's pretty. Yeah, she's trying to be alluring. And mm-hmm. oh, I'm in the constant. Oh, my God. The victimhood. Of course, she went into advocacy. OK, let me back up. It is difficult because you don't ever want to negate someone's exactly accusation of domestic violence. And if he said, yeah, we got physical and I slipped and I hit her. OK, it was obviously it was a toxic relationship. Yes. And unhealthy and unsafe and potentially violent. On the other hand, it's like, of course, she ended up going into advocacy work because then she can continue to be the victim and continue to, oh, and on top of being abused, I also had to serve time. for, And it's like 12 years for killing somebody for that much of a plan, for that much premeditation. That is nothing. I know. I, I hope someone listening is like, oh, my God, that's my yoga teacher. So <laughs> very well might be. So I went into this. I tried to keep a very open mind and I started reading Swartz article mm. so that I could get a sense yeah. for like what to look out for. And as I read Anne's book, I did not immediately get the impression that she was biased because if you've read any of her books, she always has an opinion. Like when we did the I-5 killer case, she made digs at him, digs at him all the time. Right. Like he tried to sue her for calling his penis small. Like we know (laughs) she's like that. Yeah. But I felt like the first half of the book, it was little subtle digs like basically alluding to she's known to make up stories and then suddenly that becomes the story of what actually happened. Um, But it wasn't until later where I really did, I did see her kind of strongly pushing it that way. 
Well, that's probably hard when you've done all that research on somebody and yeah. you, and you kind of get she this ha- idea uh-huh. of who they are and that they just use and abuse people. She had the opinion before she wrote the book. And here's the thing. It's not technically trial by media because she had already gone to trial. Right. She, and and if you're coming at it with proof. Yeah. If I mean, you it have, is all proof. Look at the evidence. If you have all this evidence from other husbands, from, I mean, Just the vibe of being someone that would get engaged while going to prison for killing your husband because Mm -hmm. you had this allure to some dude you rejected earlier. Like that alone tells me a lot about the type of person she was. Every single relationship she got engaged before she was ever technically divorced, which that happens. I think my dad did that, too. But uh, not over and over, though, I guess, you know, the thing. The thing I started to really see, it was the evidence that really spoke to me. So, yes, I could understand being a little bit of an exaggerator to make your life sound more exciting because you want to be with these exciting men. Right. And she's she's a climbing. She's a social climber. Right. right. She wants more money. I, I do get that to an extent. But once I saw the evidence lined up like that, I was like, no, she plotted this. She planned this and she'd done it before. She wrote a screenplay and acted it out. She wrote another one and acted it out. But I am not saying she wasn't abused because there is evidence that at least probably two times there was some sort of mutual physical violence. Right. I cannot say I believe her entire story or that it was only one sided because because there are no other people that have had any kind of negative anything with this man yeah they weren't hit they weren't yelled at he didn't drink a bunch of alcohol and forget what happened the night before Mm -hmm. like that was not his normal behavior so i definitely as of writing this officially believe she did it on purpose yeah that it was planned but i definitely went in saying you know what she was made out to be worse than she was and i was proved wrong she is is worse she's worse (laughs) yeah that to me is as bad as She's as dangerous and scary as as psycho killer guy with a knife that hunts you in the forest. Like that is so scary to me, and especially what, with all my recent exposure the, to this kind of behavior. Because yeah. you just are you're left unsteady. You're left unsure of yourself. You're left unsure of what reality is, and you can choose to like get sucked into it and think that that's what's happening, or you can step back and be like, wait, this doesn't really make sense. It's scary that someone could set a trap for you yeah years ago yeah and have yeah. the patience to wait for it to 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 go off for in the whatever perfect way. moment for your yeah so the for your story for your like your actual life story to make it the most dramatic and most yeah. oh my it god it was the perfect story except for the mistake she made you know um it reminds me a lot we watched uh was that 2020 last night i yeah, think i think so and where it was a guy who same thing total bullshit story Oh, a burglar came in. We were fighting with the gun. It, I accidentally slipped and it shot my wife in the back. And again, they were like, well, let's look at the angle. Oh, it was up right where you stand. Like, just right there. And he got married. Someone else was like, oh, he told me what happened. And yeah. and obviously they shit happens do. and you get remarried. And pe- and that's not to say, like, if someone has lost someone or there is a violent thing and, and you can't get remarried. But just, like, to feel that sure. Yeah that that's okay or a safe situation is like mind blowing to me. I just felt, I felt so guilty initially because I'm like, I, I believe women, right? Like I can't fathom someone would do this. And yet psychopathy exists. Mm -hmm. And And women, domestic violence perpetrators. Yeah. Oh yeah. One in nine men. Yeah. One in nine men. And I think that that's kind of mis misunderstood and misrepresented because You often see whether it's like online videos or in reality shows or whatever where women get pissed off and they kind of like maybe like go off on your arm and hit you a bunch or whatever. And it's like that is violence. That is domestic violence. You know, it doesn't have to be a man grabbing your neck and shoving you in a wall like you're creating an unsafe space. And I don't think that that's acknowledged because I don't think a man has to be fearful for something to be unsafe, you know. And so who knows what else this guy was dealing with with her oh what a monster and then she's just out yeah i mean she apparently hasn't done anything i mean well, I rick swart's still plea. alive so we're good there that's but. kind of a shocking plea that they had all that evidence and that they weren't just like we'll take off 
I, I know no, if I were like, the DA. No parole. We'll give you parole at 20 years instead of no parole. Oh, and she got time served. That's why she got out sooner. But Ugh. if I were the DA, I would have gone balls to the walls for that family because it's yeah. just so unfair. But, Especially with all that evidence. But they risked her going totally free. So I think that's why they were open. But the discussion about the plea took a very long time. There was a lot of back and forth. And she insisted on being involved with all the like rules that went of into course it. she did. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so she's there and she's not that far away and you know, does yoga. So if you live in the that area. Yeah, let us know if she's your yogi, <laughs> if she feels peaceful or, you know, psychotic. Should we all three go take a class? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Be like, hey, could we talk uh, afterwards? I'm I've been doing a lot of yoga. And also, um, why'd you murder your husband? No, we'll do the three of us and like our two biggest fans. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll just go there and, and yoga out. <laughs> Yeah, that's truly scary. Oof. Now, the way our body... They were more... <laughs> they were more... I, no, I did not do research on current airline policy. Why? <laughs> because I was working on this until I drove here. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Okay, let me try it again. <laughs> and then she must have zipped up. A few years later, or maybe, when did she die? Cut that out. I don't know when she died. <laughs> Cut that out, sir. What's your name? Bobby? What do we call him? To baby tiger. Danny. Danny. Roll it, Danny. Roll that beautiful bean footage. The article disputed some of the claims about Lisa and what happened. Happened. <laughs> <laughs> Just. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I'm sorry, I slurred that and I'm not saying it again. To spread awareness about, I will say it again, because I'm an asshole. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production, written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough, edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at Patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs>